Deck the halls with boughs of holly. Fa la 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 la. Good to see you this morning. Um, today we're going to talk about uh, how to restart. And if you read anything, any of the Bible, uh, for even just a minute, um, you will find that the Bible is all about new beginnings, all about new starts, all about new days, all about being broken and having a Heavenly Father who puts you back together again. But before I start the message today, I want to tell you what happened yesterday. We, uh, I had a wedding, and it was on uh, down at a golf course down in Rockledge, and it was just off the 18th hole. So I thought, I've played there before, and I'm a terrible golfer, and I thought, I think we're okay, even if they overhit, because there's some trees behind us. So we started the ceremony. I was in the middle of the vows, and I don't even know how they did it. Somebody from the practice tee hit a 90-degree angle. I, now, now, I've done that. No, not that bad. It was bad. And it bounced over the people that were sitting in the back. It bounced over them, rolled up, and... I see something out of the corner. I see everybody kind of move, and I see something out of the corner of my eye. I don't know what it is, an animal, you know, I don't know. <clears throat> and as I'm standing there, I'm, I'm looking at the vows, and we're, the husband and wife are saying the vows to each other. And I see a golf ball between the flower girl's feet, just right there. I mean, right in front of me. And, of course, you know, your brain starts to go, was that there before? Did I just not notice it? And I kind of thought that until the best man said, Hey, yell four next time! Right in the middle of the wedding. <laughs> now, I should have taken a picture because the, the, the little flower girl at the end picked up the ball and put it in her little basket before she walked down the aisle. It was awesome. And I wish I had the, the mind to take a picture of that because it was the cutest thing. She's like, eh. And they said, you can keep it. She he goes down the aisle, so it was great. Well, listen, Christmas is a time, we love Christmas movies, where there are new starts, new beginnings, wonderful life, Scrooge, which is also Christmas Carol, same thing. Um, we love the Grinch, because he figures it out. I mean, story after story at Christmas, we love to see people start over, because all of us know in life that we need do-overs. All of us knows that there's times in life that not only do we need do-overs, but there's times in life that because of someone else in your life, now you have to do a do-over because maybe somebody else's decision just for you. So here's what I want you to know about God. Can you bring me my backpack, David? I just realized I forgot my illustration. Jesus came... To bind your wounds. And when Jesus went into the temple the first time, he said, oh, somebody gave me bacon. See that? There's, there's everything in here. You never know what you'll find. Christmas. So, you ever bought one of these? This is an ace bandage. And if you've ever been hurt, one of the first things they do is they try to wrap it up. Before they even know exactly what's wrong sometimes, they'll, they'll wrap it up and then try to decide, let's get you to the doctor and see if you have a break or, or if there's you know, a spray or whatever. When you look at Scripture and you have this idea of God helping you to restart in life, it's not instant. But He wants to bind your wounds. He wants to help you to, to know that He wants to pour life into you and you can get new life, but also when you own up to the things you failed in, when you work on what you believe, and when you are able to forgive yourself and forgive other people, that's the beginning of healing. Now, it's not instant. You're not going to listen to this message today and go home and go, okay, I'm going to apply those three things, and I'm good. Because healing takes time. Just like if I sprained my wrist today, you don't put this on for a half hour and go, I'm great now. Because healing takes time. But I want to look at what the Bible says. And I want to do the Christmas story just a little differently today. John uh, uh, does different than all. He begins very differently than all the other Gospels. He, instead of starting at the manger. 
or starting with what we consider the Christmas story, he actually starts with Jesus before time began. And here's what it says. In the beginning, there was the Word. This is where we get the word logos or logos, depending on how you pronounce it. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. All things were made by Him, and nothing was made without Him. In Him there was life, and that life was the light of all the people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overpowered it. You and I typically think of Jesus being born in Bethlehem, but you and I also need to understand that Jesus existed with God before that, at the beginning of time, before that ever happened in Bethlehem. He wasn't just a baby born in a manger, it was God coming to relate to us. And so today when we look at this idea that God can heal us and Christ came so that you and I can be healed, there's two things I want you to know, okay? So we're going to talk about these two parts in this message. Number one, you can trust Christ when you fail. Some of you don't want to trust Christ when you fail, partially because of how you think he thinks about you. You think he hates you. You think he doesn't give retakes, and so we're going to talk a little bit about that. And then the second thing I want you to know is you can restart. No matter what's going on with your life, no matter where you're at right now, God wants to give you a restart. And some of you may need that in big areas of your life. Some of you may need it in small areas of your life. But we all go through times where we need a restart. Whether or not it's because we messed up or because somebody else messed up and caused difficulty in our life, we all need restart. So let's talk with the first section. Why you can trust Christ. Forgive me for sweating. This is... I feel like one of those pastors. All right, today, as we talk about this message, I'm just going to let you know the spit is going to fly. All right. So you, some of the, that wasn't funny, was it? Okay. Let me cough too, just for fun. All right. So let me talk about why you can trust Christ when, when you fail. Because some of you have a perception right now that God is mad at you. And that God not only is disappointed with you, but he's in heaven waiting to punish you. So I just want to show you a few things so that you can know I can trust God when I totally blow it, when I totally mess up. If you read scripture, you see the disciples knew that. Peter knew even though he had betrayed Christ, he was restored. That's the God that we have. So number one, Jesus and God himself created New days and new starts. Do you realize that God did not have to create days? Do you realize that the world could exist totally differently? But there's something about a new beginning. There's something about a new day. And this God who created new beginnings in, on earth can do the same for you. In Genesis 1-4, God saw that the light was good and he separated the light from darkness he called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. Do you need a new day? Do you need a do-over? You know, maybe right now in your marriage you're struggling. You're having a hard time right now, and you need a do-over. Maybe something happened in your life where, where somebody has come after you and you've been forced out of work or maybe you've gone through a divorce or maybe you're going through a difficult time and you need a do-over. But you're sitting there going, I don't know if I can handle a do-over. The good news is you need to know that God is the God of do-overs. We all need restarts. It doesn't matter who you are. We all need restarts. Sometimes, sometimes in how we think. Sometimes in the things that we do, sometimes just trying to get back on our feet. Number two, you can trust him because he's with you when you fail, but also when you hurt. Hebrews 4.15, for we don't have a high priest who is unable to empathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who's been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. What this verse is saying, this idea of of, uh, of empathize is, is where we get the word sympathy, but it's more than that. It's the idea of hurting with you. So that painful thing that you've been through that maybe you felt God was far from you, the Bible says that he hurts with you. 
That dumb thing that you did that you think God can't understand that. He, he can't understand my failure. He expects me to get everything right. No, the Bible says he sympathizes with your weakness. It doesn't say he sympathizes with your strength. What kind of God is that? This is a God who sympathizes, who feels your weakness. You ever do something and you feel like, I am so dumb. Al? <laughs> yeah, you know... There's times you do something and immediately you think, oh, right? You do the V8 hit in the head, right? And you think, if only I had known or I wish I could go back or I wish I could hit rewind or I wish I could undo. I wish I just had a five-second even re-timer. Re like I could just take, not say that thing that just blurted. The good news is no matter how weak you are, the Bible says that he sympathizes. He feels and hurts with you. And if somebody's hurt you, he hurts with you. He's not distant from you saying, you know, you should just get over that. You know, sometimes we're harder on ourselves than God ever is on us. We think, hey, listen, I had somebody, I gotta tell you this, I had somebody call me a week after a funeral, and they said to me, I don't know why I keep crying. Uh, I don't know why you would stop crying. What do you think? There's just a button? I, see, we want to hit restart like a computer. We want to hit control alternate and what? Yeah. Delete. You've had to do it. You've got a Windows computer. You don't have to do that with a Mac. Anyway, you control alternate, delete, and you have to restart the computer, right? With a Mac, you just throw it on the ground. But that's what it is. <laughs> We're in a world full of sin. And so there are going to be times because of your sin that you're going to do something dumb. Sometimes because of somebody else's sin, you're going to have to restart. They're going to force you out of a job. They're going to force you out of a position. They're going to put you in a painful place. Some of you went through things when you were a child and you think, God doesn't understand. Listen, he totally feels what you feel. And then this is awesome. Isaiah 61, this is where I got this idea. See, if you read John chapter 4, excuse me, Luke chapter 4, when Jesus went into the temple... This is the first passage that Jesus read about himself. And by the way, we have uh, copies of Isaiah from before the time of Christ. So this book is one of those that we can prove existed before Jesus. And here's what Jesus said when he went into the temple. He said, he has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives and release from darkness for the prisoners. Listen. That idea here of fine is where we get the word kabosh. Now, I don't know if it's the same as the one. I'm not a, a Hebrew scholar, so you'll have to forgive me. But in this context, it's the idea of wrapping around, of protecting, of, of letting you be wrapped up until you heal. And Jesus said, I came to wrap you up, to take care of you. We sometimes get the idea that God's there with a baseball bat. And when we get hurt, he goes, let me get it. And instead he said, I came, the first thing Jesus says publicly, I came to bind up wounds. And then it says, to help the brokenhearted. The brokenhearted means when your heart explodes. That's literally what it means. It's when your heart is crushed. It's when your spirit is quenched. All of those words are in there. And it's the idea that Jesus came so that when you're hurting, he can wrap around you and take care of you while you heal. Now, some of you are in a hurry. You, you've got the ace bandage on and you want it off instantly. Healing doesn't work that way, but he wants to heal you. He wants to work in you. And here's the other thing. Let me tell you, Christians, listen. As you're sitting there, there are people really close to you that need you to do this for them. In too many churches today, right now, there's somebody who's been hurt or somebody that's been wounded. And instead of going out of their way to look to be a place of healing, there are Christians right now who are yanking bandages off and poking people and saying, ah, you should just be better than that. You need to have more discipline. You need to have more this. You need to have more that. That should have never. If you had done this right, that would have never happened. And they're attacking people who are hurting. Jesus never did that. Do you know the only people Jesus ever attacked were religious people who thought they were better than everybody else? When people were hurting, you know what Jesus did? He went to bind up their wounds. So I want to encourage you today not only to think about the things in your life, but to think about somebody you know that might be in that position today where they need you to come alongside of them and be Jesus for them.
Maybe, maybe they need you to, to wrap your arms around them just to let them know you love them and it's okay to go through a hard time and it's okay to cry and it's okay to grieve. It's okay to struggle. And Eric, it's even okay to say dumb things every week. Thank you for those of you who tell me that all the time. We need freedom though. And it comes as Jesus wraps around us and protects us and helps us to grow. Do you realize that Jesus came? If your heart is broken today, he came for you. He came to help you. Number three, the other perception that we get is that God could care less, that he's just pointing at us or in heaven. He's got his you know, head on his hand going, oh, Eric. Now, I do think sometimes in heaven, God calls the angels and goes, you guys, look at what Eric just did. You see that golf ball? Is that awesome or what? Right? But I don't think he's in heaven going, oh, I can't believe you did that. Listen, Jesus, being the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. Taking the very nature of a servant, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. So I want you to think about this. The night before Jesus goes to the cross, okay, all the disciples are there, right? Peter, the ADD disciple, who goes to cut guards' ears off and jumps out of a boat, wants to walk on water, and says crazy things. I'll never leave you, right? All the stuff he says and does, right? You've also got Judas there. Judas is getting ready to betray Jesus, and you know what? Jesus, and Jesus knows it. But you know what he does? He washes his disciples' feet. Now, I don't know about you, but if tonight was my last night on earth, can I tell you something? I'm not washing your feet. We might be going to a party. We might eat together. We might hang out. We might reminisce. But I'm not washing your feet. Maybe I might ask you to take care of me. You know, I'm dying tomorrow. Take care of me. Jesus didn't do that. He said, I'm going to die. And yet, he served us. That's the God who loves you and cares about you. And if you have any other concept of God sitting in heaven going, I hate your guts. No, no. He is cheering for you. He's here to serve you. He wants to help you to overcome. Yeah, he doesn't want to leave you in that sin. He doesn't see sin and go, oh, I think that's great. But he wants to help you to walk through it, to walk out of it, to overcome, to be victorious, to be healed. He's cheering for you today. So let's look at some practical things, how we can restart, how we can have do-overs. Now, I want to give you a couple things before we get to the notes. These came from Andy Stanley, and I really like them. We tend to think that if we have experience, it means we're wiser. And if that was true, then what would happen is, as people got remarried, like they went through a divorce and then got remarried, you would think the percentage would go down for divorce in a second marriage, right? But if you've ever seen the statistics, it goes higher, and then third marriage higher and higher. Now, some of you have dealt with your stuff, and you've overcome that. You're in your maybe third or your fourth marriage today, and God has done a miracle in your life. But if you didn't get healed, if you didn't deal with it ahead of time, just because you knew what could go wrong didn't mean you knew or mean it changed anything about you. Experience alone does not make you better. Evaluated experience makes you better. The other thing, sometimes we think that knowledge is what will improve us. So if we've been through something or if we read a book or we did something else, we think, because I have knowledge, then I'll overcome. So I'm just going to make it really easy for you, okay? We're, just, we're going to talk about Thanksgiving for just a moment, okay? We're just going to stop right here. I want you to think about Thanksgiving Day, right? Remember on Thanksgiving Day that morning when you had that little talk with yourself? That you're not going to eat as much bread this year. And you're going to be careful about what you take in. And then you saw the food. And even though you knew better. Now maybe for you it wasn't Thanksgiving. You might be sitting there right now going, no, Eric. I did great on Thanksgiving. I ate a salad and carrots and some turkey. <laughs> that wasn't me, by the way. But anytime you go on a diet, you know what you should eat and what you shouldn't eat. And don't you still pull into McDonald's and go, I really should have a salad. Look, the Big Mac is cheaper. 
Just, just knowing something doesn't mean you're going to do it right. And just having a history of knowing something doesn't mean you're going to learn from it. So make sure that it's not just knowledge that you're learning. And then the last thing that's probably the most dangerous in our society, we think time is against us. We get in a hurry. So we go through something tragic or something traumatic or we go through a difficulty in our life and, and we're still in pain and we're still hurting. And if we're not careful, we'll jump into the next relationship or we'll jump into something else and, and make big mistakes. Why? Because we don't allow ourselves time to heal. Now, you see that in the physical world. If somebody took their cast off early, you'd be like, Are you crazy? And yet emotionally, spiritually, even physically sometimes, we don't take time to heal. So here's some things that you can do to help you restart. Number one, accept his gift of life. Let me tell you the awesome thing about God is that he's a God of renewal. And when you become a Christian, he gives you his Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit changes your heart and changes your mind. The Bible actually says that when you became a Christian, you became a new person, a new creation. I mean, it's an awesome thought. In John 3... 16, most of you know this verse. Tim Tebow had it on his eye makeup. Here's, here's what it says. I know it's not me. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. Some of you today are thinking God just came to condemn it. No, no. It says, but to save the world through him. So here's your first challenge question today. Have you admitted that you're lost without Jesus? Now, you might be here today and you're not a Christian. Maybe the first thing you need to do is say, hey, I think I can make it without him. Or I need to figure out that I can't. But it could be that you're a Christian today and the truth is, lately, you've been trying to make it without him. You, you've got a little checklist and you think if I have my quiet time and I do these 12 things and I do these spiritual things, that makes me a good Christian. But then you realize that you're not walking in love. You're not walking in joy. You're not walking in peace. Why? Because you can't do that on your own. You can't have patience. Don't drive with me. <laughs> Kindness. Those are natural things when the Holy Spirit comes into our life. He gives us that new life. Some of you have been believers for years. And you've got to come to the point and say, God, forgive me for being a religious person and not just a Christ follower. Forgive me for checking off a list when I think that I'm naughty or nice. Instead of saying, God, I want to follow you every moment. I want to listen to your voice. I want you to bring new life in me. Number two, this is the hardest one. Own up to your failures. It was funny because I threw out an illustration last night. And I pointed at one of our guys who was a manager. And he managed people who were uh, uh, minimum wage people. And so I just made this up. And he came to me later. He said, that's exactly true. I said, suppose you worked with Rodney. And Rodney goes here to church, and he worked at Publix for years and years in produce. And so they had to put out red apples and green apples, and I don't know, there's like four billion types of apples. Is Rodney in here? He can tell you how many apples there are. But anyway, there's like a million. And um, so, so you get the apples out, and then one day you hire a new person, and they come, and they put the green apples where the red apples are supposed to be. So you go to them, and you say, hey, hey, listen, we don't put the red apples there. Now let me tell you what happens. And if you've worked at a McDonald's, if you've worked at Walmart, if you've been at Walmart, if you've been at these folks, you will see this happen. What happens is people can't take correction anymore. And they lose their minds. They cannot admit that they made a mistake. Some of you who are teachers today are like, that's absolutely happening in my classroom. Why? Because we have a sin nature which we try to protect. So the boss comes and says, hey, the green apples go here. And you go, whoa, nobody taught me that. Somebody trained me the wrong way. And they blame other people when the easiest thing to do would be to go, okay, I'll move the apples. Now, if you have a teenager, you totally get this. Because you go to them and you say, hey, you need to clean up your room. And they lose their mind for 20 minutes. And then you think, you realize you could have had your room clean already, right? But we love to look at other people. But the truth is we all do this. If you've been hurt by somebody, here's your deal. You're looking at them going, it's all their fault. And when you tell their story, you don't take any blame for yourself. Do you know how I know that? Because Adam and Eve did the same thing. Remember Adam and Eve? They go to eat the apple. 
God comes to Adam and says, hey, Adam, what's going on? Who told you? Adam looks at God and says, hey, God, this woman that you gave me. I mean, Adam could have just said, God, I, I blew it. Don't punish anybody else. Punish me. It's my fault. I was supposed to be in charge here, and I, I ate it. Instead, he said, God, not only is it her fault, but it's your fault. And that's exactly what we do. And if you're not careful, you will not evaluate your experience the right way, and you will not take any blame for any failure. So if you've gone through a divorce, you need to look. What is your part? I don't care if it's point zero 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 one percent Figure it out. If you were fired from a job, what's your percent? If you failed a paper, what's your percent? Maybe you had the worst teacher ever, but what's your, what could you have done better? In Romans 3.23, the Bible reminds us, everyone has sinned. Anybody in here excluded from that verse? Other than now? Everyone has sinned and fallen, they didn't even think that was funny, and fallen short of God's glorious standard. So here's the second question for you. What is my part in my failure? In something that happened. Maybe, hey, it might be as simple as letting somebody be an enabler to somebody who hurt you. It may be as simple as where you met a person that you could have gone back and said, eh, probably shouldn't have been going to the bar to pick up people. Does that sound like a real stretch for anybody? Number three, rethink your past. We don't always see our past the right way. We tend to blame other people. We tend to think it's other people's fault. We tend to think that the way we see life is perfect. There's a story about a lady who was in an airport, and um, she was hungry, so she went to a little snack thing, and she got her some Thin Mint cookies. I love Thin Mint cookies. Don't bring them to my house. I will eat the whole thing. I always feel like if they're refrigerated or frozen, you can eat a whole sleeve, and you won't gain any weight. See, it's a lie. We'll go back to that, number one. All right, so, so she gets some Thin Mints. She sits down. She sets her Thin Mints next to her. The guy next to her picks up her Thin Mints and opens them and starts eating her Thin Mints. She's furious. She looks over at him. She reaches down. She grabs a Thin Mint. She looks at him. He, he takes another one. There's only, a, there's only a few. He takes another one. So she eats a couple of more. They get to the end of the package. There's one left. This guy had all the gall. He reached down, took the last thin mint, broke it in half, and gave her half. She, was, she ate it, got on her flight, sat down. It's just fuming. I can't believe this guy would eat my thin mints. And she looked down at her purse, and there was a roll, her roll, of thin mints. <laughs> Now you're thinking, Eric, I'm smarter than that. I don't blame other people. I see things the right way. All right, time out. Ready? Ready? You ready for it to go home? Buckle up. Here it comes. You ready? Have you ever lost your keys? <laughs> and if you have children, or if you're married, now if you're single, I don't know who you blame. You're like the dog must have got them, right? Or my friend came over, they must have moved them, right? But if you have anyone in the house, anyone, it could be somebody who could never even get close to the keys. They're this tall, and your keys are up on a hook. And you go, I wonder where you put my keys. And you walk around the house, right? And if it's early in the morning, you might even wake up people. Hey, you got my keys? Right? And then you think... Wait a second, what was I wearing last night? <laughs> Found them! <laughs> no apology, right? You don't go through the house and go, I'm just sorry, everybody. No. You think, well, and here's what you'll say. Listen, here's what you'll say. You ready? Let me, let me tell you what you say. Well, I wouldn't blame you if it wasn't usually you. Right? You like that? That's the kind of stuff we do. And we do it in so many things that we don't even realize it. In Romans 12, we need to realize, don't be shaped by this world. Instead, be changed by a new way of thinking. Let God evaluate how you look at life. Let God evaluate how you look at other people. 
If you tend to blame everybody else, let God begin to deal with you to why you do that. If you begin to think everything else is somebody else's fault, if you think God doesn't love you, God, would you change my mind? That's where we get the word, the way of thinking, metamorphosis. Then you'll be able to decide what God wants for you. You'll know what's good and pleasing to him and what is perfect. So here's the next question. What was I thinking that led to my failure? If you maybe chose the wrong person to, to, to do life with, or, or maybe you got into a job you shouldn't have, or maybe you got into a situation, whether it was in college or something, that you shouldn't have, what were you thinking? Because if you don't figure out what you were thinking, then later on when you get a retake, you will think the same way. Most people, about a year after they have a car that they're making payments on, go, oh, you know what I could be doing with that money every week? So the next time you're on the car lot, when that car's four years old and you're starting to think, I want a new one, you need to say, what was I thinking? And is that right thinking? So many people have a car payment and don't have $100 in the bank. By the way, Dave Ramsey coming up February. We'll tell you more about that. Number four, release your sins to God and release your hurts from others. We all know that we should do this. We just don't do it well. Jesus said this, Matthew 6, and I love this from the children's Bible because I think it really brings it home. Forgive the sins we've done, Jesus said, just as we've forgiven those who did wrong to us. So here's the question. If God only forgives you as much as you forgive that person that hurt you, how are you doing? He wants you to forgive. Now, forgiveness doesn't mean you have to hang around that person. Forgiveness does not mean you have to let that person. Forgiveness is not trust. If somebody's hurt you, it doesn't mean allowing them back into your life to continue to hurt you. But forgiveness says, I am no longer holding the note. I'm no longer going to think, I wonder what they're doing now. I hope they fail. I hope they get cancer. I hope they die. By the way, I had somebody come to me about somebody who hurt me one time, and they said, I hope they get cancer. And I said, I, I hope they don't. What? what? Why do you hope that? I said, because I don't want God to judge me that way, so why would I judge somebody else that way, even if they're an idiot? I've been an idiot plenty of times. Even this morning. Some of you are like, yes, we noticed. Now let me tell you what I know. This one's hard. And you may be sitting there going, Eric, I'm not doing that. That person does not deserve forgiveness. You are right. So here's what I want you to do. Begin to pray. God, just be honest with God. God, I don't feel like even forgiving them at all. Not only, God, do I not feel like forgiving them, if I could, I would hurt them. So, God, would you help me to move from this position where I'm in in order to get to where I can forgive? Why? Because in Colossians it says he's rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption. You've been redeemed, and you have the forgiveness of sins. Not because you earned it, not because you did anything good enough, but because even in your failure, he died for you. I love what Andy Stanley says here. How long do you plan to allow the people who mistreated you to influence your future? Have you asked for forgiveness and given forgiveness? Have you? Is that picture next or did I miss the picture? Can we go back to the picture real quick? Sorry. This word metamorphosis that the Bible talks about is a description of this. It's the idea of going from being a caterpillar to a butterfly. Too many of us, because we don't understand God's love for us, we continue to live like we're caterpillars when God has created us to be beautiful and to fly. And yet we just continue to root around on the ground because we don't understand his love for us. His acceptance of us. Listen, even if you get this sermon totally wrong, even if while I was talking, you're like, I'm not doing that. Eric, that sounds really good to forgive somebody, but not happening. What's awesome about God is even in the middle of that, he still loves you. And he loves you enough that in the middle of your hurt, he still wants to bind your wounds. He doesn't want you to repeat the same thing over and over. He wants you to learn. He wants you to grow. He wants you to be more loving and more kind and more gracious. And as you go through life to experience more peace 
and more joy. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. Maybe you've never surrendered to him. Maybe you're a Christian today and you're struggling with one of these things. I just want to encourage you to tell, ask God, God, would you begin to work in my life? I included a few verses in the notes that talk about who you are in Christ. But if you want to Google who I am in Christ, you will find hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of verses that explain who you are in Christ. And that may be just what God uses to begin to bind your heart and to put those broken pieces of your heart back together again. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, thank you for your word. I thank you that you came to bind our wounds, not to attack us, not to shame us, not to punish us. You came to bind our wounds and heal our broken hearts. And Father, in this life, we get brokenhearted over and over again, and you came to heal us. Father, I pray for that one today who needs your healing. They came in this morning so discouraged and so heartbroken. They don't know what to do. Father, I pray you begin to work in them. Father, I pray for those that we know who are brokenhearted, that we could be those who, who come around and protect them. Unlike so many churches that attack hurting people, I want to pray, Father, that we would not be Christians that attack hurting people, but instead we would surround them and love them and help them to be healed. Lord, thank you for your healing in our lives. Thank you for new life. In Jesus' name, amen. Every time of giving now, you give what God's put on your heart today. And um, Neil has a great Christmas song to close our service. If you need prayer, I'll be here after the service. Thanks for coming today.